Here is a Sony picture book from the year 2000, which has an unusual form factor. I'm going to upgrade the hard drive and then install the correct operating system. Picture books, also known as VAO C1 models, were a series of VAOs that Sony had originally launched in 1998. Two defining aspects of the picture book were the built-in camera, a first for a laptop to come with a built-in webcam, and the small size thanks to the very wide, low-height display. The picture book was marketed as a visual communicator, with the camera abilities seen as an asset in business environments. The Sony Vio Notebook mm. <laughs> with inbuilt no. camera. The picture book was popular enough for Sony to continue updating and releasing new models for the next four years until 2002. Many different variations were available, including some with built in Bluetooth. Later models had upgrades in CPU speed, memory size, hard drive capacity. The model I have here is the PCG C1VM from the year 2000. Let's do a bit of an overview of the hardware. So there is the low height display and here's the camera which can also rotate right around to face outwards or inwards towards the user. There's two stereo speakers on the front here and controlling the mouse is with a mouse nub inside the keyboard here. There are a number of indicator lights on this machine. At the front here we've got power, battery and hard drive access. At the top of the keyboard there's memory stick, num lock, caps lock, scroll lock. There's the power up button and there's a dedicated capture button for quick access to the inbuilt camera. Have a look at the sides and here is a jog dial for up down and push in to select. There's a mini VGA output and power in and there's USB 1.1, microphone, headphones and composite video out because they really wanted to make this machine connect to as many video devices as they could. On the other side there is the iLink Firewire port for connecting to camcorders. There's a PCMCAA slot and the memory stick slot and ventilation. Overall quite a neat little machine. If we have a look at the bottom of the machine we can see this model originally came with Microsoft Windows Millennium Edition. So obviously we should be installing Windows 2000. Wait a minute, what? So in the year 2000 when this computer came out Microsoft released two different versions of Windows. With Windows 98 SE having been launched in 1999 and Windows XP coming in 2001, that left Windows Millennium Edition and Windows 2000 to have only been a current operating system for a very short window. When I power up this picture book, it comes on and gives us a choice of Windows XP, which I don't have the password for, or older version of Windows, which I've used to check and make sure that everything works. If I had it back in the day, I probably also would have installed Windows XP, but I want to restore this computer back to an original year 2000 configuration. So I think that means installing Windows 2000 and Windows Millennium Edition dual boot. Though there's another complication. This model includes a Transmeter Caruso CPU, which was a CPU developed that could emulate Intel Pentium x86 CPUs using only one tenth the number of transistors. I did do a video that went into a bit more depth about that CPU called the strange code morphing CPU inside the Sony Veo U1. One of the people that worked at Transmeter developing this CPU was Linus Torvalds. And if we have a look at this picture we can see Linus proudly holding his Sony picture book running Linux. So I may have to make this a triple boot system to cover all these operating systems. Okay, time for disassembly. First we'll take the battery off, which is this cylindrical thing on the back. 
and get some protection down. Undo all the screws. There's a panel here. We'll have a look under the panel. Okay, panel. Ah. All right, we can see RAM on the main board and obviously some sort of expansion that's not populated. And it looks like there is an inbuilt switch here. That could be a reset switch, I suppose. Not accessible from outside the unit. All right, let's keep taking it apart. There is a service manual available for this unit and I have had a quick look over it, but mostly I'll just be working my way through. Now one of the things I have to do is take off the plastic caps that cover the hinges. So I'm just going to very carefully take this apart. So if we look here we can see that there's some work being done on this machine before by someone. Okay. And the other side. Yeah, you can really see the markings there. This has been disassembled in the past. So the bottom screws are out. Now the front should begin to lift off. Let's see what happens. I can hear a lot of clips coming undone. So I've just spotted there is another screw here, which with this front needing to come off, I'm going to have to remove this. Okay, I referred back to the service manual and it's told me that to remove the top section, I first have to remove the keyboard. And there's, yep, there's clips there and one over here. Come on, there we go. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Let's disconnect. Okay, pointing device and keyboard. Now there should be some more screws, and there are. Okay, three more screws are out. There's a plate here. Okay, and another ribbon cable to disconnect. All right, now let's see if that lifts off, and that's pretty good. There's something still connecting, so there's another cable here. Okay. Right, done. And the hard drive itself is a 160 gigabyte Western Digital. This is an upgrade because this computer was originally sold with, or well, the starting models were four gigabyte hard drives, and the final models before it was discontinued were 30 gigabyte. So at some point this has been upgraded to 160 and had Windows XP added. All right, so this hard drive is screwed in. Okay. Let's just very carefully unplug this. Okay, drive is disconnected. If we have a look at this hard drive, we can see that it was manufactured March 2008 giving us an idea of when this computer was last upgraded. And I'll be replacing this with one of these IDE to SD card adapters. And I'll be using a 16 gigabyte micro SD card in this adapter. It may seem a little bit odd to go from 160 gigabytes to 16, but 16 is closer to the capacity that this machine would have originally had back in the year 2000. 
One of the other things I want to do is mess about with these operating systems that I've never really had much experience with, Windows Millennium Edition or Windows 2000. And solid state storage is just going to it's going to make that whole experience a lot more enjoyable. Okay, so that flops around a bit. I'll have to find a way to secure that in there. Whoa. Okay, I've got a bit of double-sided tape in there. And that'll just not really work. But at least it stops this adapter from moving around, perhaps damaging the cable. I'm just going to go with that for now. So I've just noticed this really unusual looking component right here. It's just this long thing with connections on both sides. It could be a connector of some sort. I had a look in the service manual but this doesn't go into enough detail. I've never really seen anything quite like it. I don't know what it is. Okay, so I'm going to take the brackets off the old hard drive and put them back in the machine. And that will sort of add some structural rigidity to the internals. Okay, so that should help a lot for strength. That feels pretty good. All right, let's get this together because I'm keen to get this up and running again. Should just, there we go. Pretty easy, clip down. Done. While I'm here, I'm just gonna do a quick power up test. Make sure that it does actually turn on. Power light, fan, spins up, display comes on. Okay, well it is turning on, the display comes on, so I'll continue with the reassembly. Maybe I should have put the side pieces back in before I screwed the top down. Well, you live and learn. loosen this screw and then I should be able to just get that side piece in fairly easily. Yep. Nice. Okay, this one. Good. And then battery straight on. Okay, done. So I'll be using this CD-ROM drive with a PCMCIA card. Get that into the side of the unit. Okay, let's get ready to install. Now when I power up currently, we should be able to eject the CD-ROM. There we go. Let's get an operating system. One of the things about these CD-ROM drives that use a PCMCIA is that you can't just use an original copy of Windows from before Windows XP because they don't have the drivers to work with this sort of setup. I will give it a quick go because I want to see what happens but I'm expecting this to not work. So if I do start Windows setup with CD-ROM then this is where it tries to detect the drive but it just doesn't work so it will there we go so that doesn't work we can't use this method fortunately I do have a copy of the original install disk and that should have the correct drivers on it it should also have all the drivers and the application specifically for this model so it should make the install really smooth Okay, so it's starting up. Let's get a close up. It says starting Windows 98 on the screen there, but I expect it's still going to be Windows Millennium Edition. Nice close up there. OK. 
Okay, now I'm going to change the partition size. I'm going to make four four gigabyte partitions for this machine. It's an interesting set of options. It just you can choose from these eight different cases. I'm going to choose the first option, four gigabyte C, and we'll worry about the rest of the drive later. Okay, let's see what happens. All right, it looks like it's now installing and we're not going to get the usual Windows Millennium Edition installer it's just going to be this custom Sony installation okay that seems to be going well it's now asking for disk 2 of the setup so it's booting off the second disk presumably because it still has to do something okay final settings All right we'll initialize the BIOS sure and that's looking pretty good it looks like we have Windows Millennium Edition all installed okay we're going to do another restart and we have to restart yet again I think it's probably been five restarts so far almost ready done we've got uh, Got the first operating system. There we go. Oh, look at that. Thank you for purchasing this VAO. One time initialization. Okay. Oh, and we have to restart yet again. How about that? Okay, with Windows Millennium Edition all installed, I'm going to install the next operating system, Windows 2000. This is the Service Pack 4 edition, which is from later than 2000. But that doesn't matter for this particular project. So I've started the installer from inside Windows Millennium Edition. And it's complaining a little bit because I think that Windows ME came out after 2000 so I don't want to upgrade I just want to see if I can install it alongside All right so before I continue with the setup let's see if I can work out how to adjust the partitions okay well in Windows 2000 setup when booted from the disk it looks like I can adjust the partitions here Okay, I've set up the petitions, but I'm not going to use the boot menu to install Windows 2000. I'm going to start the setup from inside Windows Me. Because I think that will be easier to set up the dual boot system if I do it this way. Alright, let's start Windows 2000 setup. I don't want to upgrade. I want to install. I want to choose the installation partition during setup and let's see how that goes NTFS yep format okay I'll eject the disk and we'll see what happens Alright, we've got Windows 2000 starting up. That looks fine. I think it worked. Okay, the setup configuration seems to have completed. So, eject the disk and finish. And let's see what happens. Okay, start up and we have two options. Let's go into Windows 2000 first. No, we've got a blue screen and then a restart. So something is wrong with Windows 2000. So it looks like I'm going to need to install Linux from Real Mode DOS. And Windows Millennium Edition doesn't include an easy to access Real Mode DOS. So I'm going to use a floppy drive and a Windows 98 boot CD. We'll get the floppy drive plugged into the USB. Now I'll start this up 
and we'll see what happens. Okay, we'll start the computer without CD-ROM support because it's simply not required in this configuration. Okay, we've got a DOS prompt. Let's go to the E drive and we'll go to the install files and let's run setup. Okay. Okay, install files are on the E drive. Okay, that doesn't matter. We're going to use loadlin. Uh, it might work. We'll give it a try. Okay, we've got 128 megabytes of RAM. Installing from hard disk. That's the path of the Okay, and just go with the default and no parameters. Do you want to install Loadlin now? Well, we'll give it a go, we'll see what happens. Okay, a last advice. Well, we'll see what happens. Well, that didn't really work. <laughs> Okay, I've decided not to pursue a multi-boot system for now. I'm going to come back to this one day when I've got a bit more knowledge about what's going wrong. I want to finish up with talking about the shape of this display. The resolution on this model is 1024 by 480 pixels. The aspect ratio is basically an ultra-wide screen display. More than a decade before ultra-wide was even a thing. Though it's not quite ultra-wide. I'll start by playing an old school 4x3 aspect ratio TV show. So when I go full screen, notice the huge black bars on each side. Next I'm playing a more modern TV show in the much more familiar 16x9 aspect ratio. If I go full screen, notice there are still black bars on each side. Now if I play a cinematic movie and go full screen, you notice the bars are now at the top and the bottom. So this display is not quite ultra wide screen, though it's pretty close to 21 by 9 and pretty close to most cinematic widescreen movies. And you'll notice in this clip, Picard himself is using his own old school 4x3 screen. Another quick note is that newer TV shows are starting to use this cinematic aspect ratio and they're starting to look really good on ultra wide screen displays. Now if they could just make the stories a bit better, they'd actually be worth watching. Another advantage of ultra widescreen is you can almost fit two 4x3 displays next to each other, such as these two LCARS panels. So I can do a subspace scan and a molecular analysis on the same panel simultaneously. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.